Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have with us uh, this evening uh, Pastor Marty Benfield. We'll come right on up, Mr. Benfield. You know, you always have opportunities. Uh, occasionally you get a call for uh, a, a not divine assistance, but uh, commissioner assistance or community assistance. And we spoke on the phone about a, a property issue and, uh, and uh, put him in touch with Brian and talked. And he said, if I can help you, at any time, let me know. And I said, man, what an opportunity. So uh, <laughs> on behalf of uh, the Board of County Commissioners, welcome to our board meeting. And we thank you so much for coming and offering an invocation. Thank you so much. I, uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the invitation and the chance to do this. For those that are so inclined, please bow your heads to pray with me. Father, we come here tonight, first of all, to give you thanks for your great love and mercy. We are blessed beyond belief as a nation, and we are not worthy of the great love and gifts of your grace. We know, Lord, that your word teaches us to honor those in authority. Romans 13, 1 says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, and let no authority except God, which God has established. The authority that exists has been established by God. So tonight we are here to honor all those that you have placed in authority. We also know that your word teaches us to pray for all of those even and especially those in authority. So we're here tonight, Lord, to pray for wisdom, for guidance during this meeting tonight, that you would lead through your spirit, bless each one here in attendance, and that these in charge make the decisions for this community that will glorify you and that your will would be done in this community. As Daniel once prayed, God, hear the prayers and petitions. Lord, look with favor in this place of meeting. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your ears and open your eyes and see. We do not make these requests of you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen, forgive, Lord, hear, and act. And we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation of God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, there's nobody signed up for informal comments tonight, so we'll go to uh, item number 22. 081 recognition of service of Catherine Brown public communications director and Mark's gonna handle this for us thank you mr. chairman um, this is certainly uh, bittersweet um, Catherine joined Union County in 2019 as our first public communications director um, shortly after Becoming county manager, one of the strategic goals uh, that I uh, had been working on was uh, public communications and more specifically, how do we, how we tell Union County's story. Union County is a wonderful place, as I, I think we can all attest to, um, and uh, so often, uh, in the past, it, it, it's uh, been that we really haven't told our story very well to, to those in, in the county and those that uh, are in uh, the region. Um, so putting together a public communications team was a first priority uh, some 36 months ago. Uh, Catherine Brown was selected as the, the public communications director and during her, ten, her tenure with us, she assembled a team of talented communications staff. She oversaw the redesign of the uh, county's website, an important way that we communicate with, with uh, the general public, and spearheaded a branding initiative that brought us uh, a great product focused on a brand new, uh, uh, on a brand, new brand. Uh, with the tagline, you know, plant your future. Uh, many of you have seen that. 
Additionally, she and her team uh, have won numerous awards at the state and national level for their work uh, in communication, specifically during the COVID pandemic. And I will say from firsthand experience, um, when you are trying to manage through uh, a, an event uh, such as a pandemic in the early stages of that event, when there are so many unknowns and you're trying as, as, uh, as a leader in the organization, trying to pay attention to all of the operational needs, making sure that, uh, that we are continuing to provide all of the basic services that the general public expects us to provide, um, thinking about how we are communicating with the public, sometimes uh, would fall through the crack. And quite honestly, I do not know what we would have done without a public communications group as talented as the one that Catherine Brown led and assembled. Uh, her contributions to Union County are greatly appreciated and uh, she will leave a lasting impression uh, and, and we are, are grateful for everything that she's done for us. Catherine, as you can tell by uh, my comments so far, is uh, leaving the organization to go to the private sector. Uh, and we're, uh, and, and it is a promotion for her, by the way. Uh, and it, that's a testament to the, the skill and the professionalism um, that Catherine brings. We wish her uh, every success uh, in the future. And Catherine, I believe, did you have some words you wanted to share with the commission? If that's okay. Absolutely. I'm not short of words. Good evening. Chairman Ray, Vice Chairman Williams, commissioners, thank you so much. I really um, appreciate you taking the time to do this recognition. It's really special to me. Um, and to my family, so I appreciate that so much. Um, it was truly an honor to serve the residents of Union County. Um, I can't say enough about this leadership team. Mark, Michelle, Patrick, Brian, they, um, it was such an honor to work with them, to, to work with people who are trying to get something done and get it done right and solve problems and do it with all of their uh, awesome senses of humor that converge together. Um, that made it a lot of fun. So um, I know that public communications was able to accomplish a lot during that time, um, but we would not have been able to do it without them and without that awesome team, who a few of them are here, Brent Ayers, Nicole, Liz, and Chris Mumpower in the back, and then a few um, not able to be here. So I have a couple of special recognitions, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep going. I'm sure Patrick's like, how long is she gonna take? Settle in. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to put the timer on. Chris can put the timer on. Chris put the timer on me. Thank you. Okay. So I have two recognitions. One, Liz Cooper. Um, she is the best partner um, that I could have had to go through what Mark talked about. Um, Michelle Lancaster, my other support, guidance, um, person who said, yep, go for it. And I'm like, ooh, really? Okay, yes, let's do it. <laughs> Um, so I'm really looking forward to watching where they're going to take the team. There's a bunch of other people, um, but I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but I will say, I do want to kind of speak to the EOC experience, and um, that is an experience that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Um, and I'm working with emergency management, Don Moye, Andrew Ansley, working with public health, Dennis Joyner, Michelle McGrath, um, and everyone in the organization, salt of the earth, the best people. And this has been such a rewarding experience. And I appreciate your um, confidence in me, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. And thank you, Liz Cooper. Um, so I wish you nothing but the best and um, as you continue to grow and prosper as a county and an organization. Thanks. Good luck in your new venture. Okay, 22-057, uh, February Service Awards and Retirements. Uh, the Employee Recognition Program acknowledges employees for full-time continuous service at the following intervals, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 years of service. We'd like to recognize the following employees for full-time continuous service with Union County Local Government. Sherry Horn, Community Support and Outreach, five years. Caleb Barnett, Sheriff's Office, five years. Anthony Mason, Sheriff's Office, five years. Kenda Griffin, Human Services, Business Ops, 10 years. Mark Helm, Sheriff's Office, 10 years. Jennifer Crumpler, General Services, 15 years. Wendy Sanderson, Health, 15 years. Christopher Black, Sheriff's Office, 15 years. Sheila Gregory, Community Support and Outreach, 20 years. Kimberly Rollins Price, Public Works, 20 years. Kevin Benton, Sheriff's Office, 25 years. Monica Smith, Social Services, 25 years. Kathy Farley, Building Code Enforcement, 10 years. That was a retirement. Patricia Anius, Community Support and Outreach, 15, 18 year retirement. And Gracie Caldwell, Social Services, 25 years retirement. Thank you to all our employees. Okay, now we go to the consent agenda. Does uh, anybody want to modify or do I hear a motion to approve as presented? Motion to approve as presented. All right, we have a motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Brian's trying to get your attention. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, it, it, I'd like to make a suggestion if you might consider it. Um, if you wouldn't mind considering moving the rezoning decisions uh, 045, 046, and 047 uh, so that those decisions can be made. Anyone here can, can hear those decisions, and, and then we'll do the Yadkin update after that. Would you be willing to consider that uh, request? Okay. I'll make a motion to move the wastewater treatment capacity monthly update and the Yadkin Regional Water Supply Project update uh, to after 2247, which is the rezoning petition of Steadley. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Uh, Bjorn, you want to come present the first one? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Manager Watson. This is the rezoning uh, for CZ 2021-007 Blue Star. Public hearing was held two weeks ago. This is the rezoning for approximately 573 acres um, south of Parkwood School to rezone to from RA 40 to RA 200 with conditions in order to construct a solar farm. Uh, the conditions are uh, the same as what was presented at the public hearing, although the applicant has made an offer for uh, decommissioning plan, but that is not included as, as a part of it. All right, I'm sorry, not a decommissioning plan, but a decommissioning bond. So um, I will scroll through the slides and go to the recommendation, which again was for approval consistent with the planning board um, <clears throat> due to uh, the use and intensities consistent with the adopted land use map and the uh, lack of noise, light, or traffic impacts and um, will not substantially injure the values of of adjacent or abutting properties. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about this request, but the request is to either approve or deny the rezoning. 
Any questions, comments? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I'd like to make, make a motion that we deny the rezoning position, petition of CZ 2021-007 to rezone the property appearing on tax map as parcels 04282 006, 04255 002, 04255004, and U4 225003F in the Buford Township from RA40 to R200 with conditions and to adopt the consistency and reasonable statement for denial. Any discussion? Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I've struggled some with this one, but uh, I'm inclined to support the rezoning. Um, the, our planning staff uh, recommended it for approval. Our planning board unanimously uh, recommended it for approval. Um, I think when you look at possible alternative uses of the site, I, I think uh, the proposed use is makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a good deal of business personal property uh, that will get taxed by the county. And um, I think n none of this uh, development will uh, be an impact to our roads or to uh, Union County Public Schools. Um, I would, um, you know, I would uh, politely uh, encourage uh, Commissioner Helms to perhaps withdraw his motion and consider instead a motion to table um, to give our uh, legal staff time to perhaps uh, develop some um, requirements along the lines of um, bonding. You know, uh, when this gets broken down, uh, what might those bonding requirements look like? Uh, that is an important element to me uh, for potentially approving something like this. But again, I'm, I'm inclined to, you know, to look at this favorably. Commissioner Hales. I respectfully would request that we continue with my motion. Okay. We have a motion to deny it. All in favor? Aye. Uh, all opposed? No. 4 1. Okay. 2246 rezoning petition RZ 2021 Crane. Gentlemen, this is uh, also a rezoning that went through a public hearing two weeks ago. This is an RZ case, meaning that is a straight rezoning. There are no conditions associated with it. It is a request to rezone from R40 to R15 in order to allow it to be split into two lots. And here's a uh, survey of the property showing that it is feasible to split into two lots. Uh, at the meeting two weeks ago, a request was made to explore having uh, septic as an option because of the length of sewer that has to be um, extended to serve these properties. Uh, the applicant did not submit a, um, a perk test for the properties. And scrolling down to the staff recommendation, uh, staff, the planning board recommended denial and staff recommended denial. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Anybody want to offer a motion? No. Commissioner Russian. Uh, yes, I'm just looking for the right one here. Uh, I would like to make a motion to deny the zoning re zoning uh, rezoning petition RZ-2021-008 to rezone the property appearing on the tax map as parcel 06-204-011D in the Sandy Ridge Township from R40 to R15 and adopt the consistency and reasonableness statement up for denial. All right, we have a motion. Any discussion? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor of denying the rezoning? Aye. Aye. All opposed, so it was unanimous. Okay, moving on to the next one, 22-47, Bjorn. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, this is also a rezoning that was heard at a public hearing two weeks ago. This is a CZ case, meaning that there are conditions associated with the rezoning request. 
This is a request to rezone a little more than six acres on NC-75 um, between Monroe and Mineral Springs from RA-40 to B-4 with conditions in order to build many storage buildings on an existing commercial site. Conditions are listed below. Uh, the site plan is as follows. So there's an existing rental home on site that would be demolished and mini storage would be installed on the uh, western side of the site. It meets our development standards. And I will go to the staff recommendation, um, staff recommended approval as well as the planning board. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? Um, Commissioner Hayams. Yes, uh, we discussed this last time. There were some uh, requirements for tree planting that were included in that. And That's my correct. understanding, the trees that were cut down prior, were prior to this rezoning request several years. Commissioner and I'm Hayams. just asking what, what the status is. Speak to that. Commissioner Hayams, they, uh, they, they called me. There was a mistake. Mr. Steadley made a mistake. They had a, a, uh, a flyover of it a month before he applied or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, we, have, we have aerial photos that show yeah. that it, the trees have been cut down several weeks after the application. Right. So uh, he's willing to go ahead with plant a tree, save a life, and all that. Mr. Chairman, then may I make a motion to approve? Uh, the rezoning petition CZ 2020-009 to rezone the property appearing on tax map as parcel 09351-024 in the Monroe Township from RA40 to B4 CZ and to adopt the consistency and reasonability statement for approval. Okay. Any questions? We have a motion. Okay. I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. Uh, oh, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Brian, we'll go back to 22-053. Uh, yes, sir. So we actually do not have a presentation for the information on the wastewater. That is just for information only and in your packets. We do, however, have a presentation from uh, John Shuzak on the Yadkin update. So, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. No problem. John, you sport a different look. <laughs> I am to please, sir. Chairman Ray, Vice Chairman Williams, Commissioners, Mr. Manager, thank you for the time this evening. Uh, I'm going to be giving you an update on our Yadkin Regional Water Supply Program. <clears throat> So I'll give you a brief overview of the project. We'll talk about the raw water infrastructure project, the finished water infrastructure project. Uh, we'll touch on the budget uh, as well as the schedule, and then I'll close out with a, a fun fact. So the overall project, as you all recall, uh, includes an intake and pump station uh, on Lake Tillery here. Uh, we've got approximately 30 miles of raw water transmission main shown in that purplish dashed line that goes from from Norwood all the way through Stanley County down to the new water treatment plant, which is shown in the magenta circle there. Uh, and then the east-west line is the finished water transmission main. Uh, important to note that uh, that finished water transmission main does connect to our existing system uh, at five different locations along its route. So that's at Old Camden, Morgan Mill, Sykes Mill, 601, and Ridge Road. Uh, and then it ultimately terminates uh, at the intersection of Seacrest Shortcut and uh, Rocky River Road. The kind of purple short dash line you see running north-south, that's a separate project that is underway uh, in the design phase right now. That's the east side transmission main or 762 pressure zone main, as you might hear me say. I kind of use those interchangeably. Uh, but that's a future project, 24-inch uh, line that will bring water to the Marshville and Wingate area. John, if I'm, I might, with regard to that particular line, uh, and I may be getting ahead of you in the presentation, but in the design of the uh, water treatment plant, uh, anticipating that line being put in north to south, 
uh, headworks were installed or, or included in that project. So when it comes time to put in that line, it's turn the valve and the water flows. Is that correct? It, it, it's not exactly that simple, but oh, yes, wow. we, we are making... Uh, That's the reason I brought it up. We, we are making provisions to accommodate that project in the future, and yes, you were getting ahead of me in the presentation. I will touch on that briefly. Uh, just a preview on the, the budget numbers here. We had $274.1 million in a guaranteed maximum price across the program, and that's against an overall program budget of just short of $304 million. Uh, the project was slated for substantial completion in May of 2023, uh, and that, that was predicated on us giving a notice to proceed in uh, August, September timeframe of 2020. Uh, and we've got final completion in November of 2023. Oops. So we'll start out with the, uh, the raw water project. Uh, as you can see in the upper right here, you've got the rendering of the pump station that's on uh, Lake Tillery in Norwood. Uh, and then in the, the lower left, uh, you'll see the schematic of the pipeline alignment that runs from Norwood, generally east-west over to Oakboro, and then kind of south and west uh, into Union County onto the water treatment plant site. Uh, the colors that you're seeing on the graphic of the transmission main, green indicates that the pipeline's been installed. Uh, yellow means that it's underway, and white means that it has not yet been started. So you can see we've made a uh, start on a significant portion of that pipeline uh, with roughly 20 to 30 percent of the, the pipeline installation actually being completed this time. The overall contract limit is $157.6 million, and that's comprised of the $156.2 million GMP, as well as an additional contingency allowance, which was $1.4 million on this side of the, the program. Uh, to date, we haven't had any change orders on the raw water project, and, and we are projecting substantial completion for the end of June of 2023, as opposed to the initial target in the contract of May. So we're running about two months behind, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the schedule slide. So I'm just going to run you through some progress photos of uh, the activity that's been going on in the raw water project. Uh, here you're seeing the intake site, looking out obviously towards the lake, uh, the wet well in the foreground. You can see the, uh, the short uh, brick building kind of lost in between some, uh, some equipment and uh, uh, a skid steer there in the background. That's the existing Norwood facility uh, that is actually still in service while we're doing this project. So doing a good job working around that facility. And the, the construction of the wet well is largely complete at this point. Uh, so one of the activities that had to take place before we could proceed with finishing out the inside of the wet well was the installation of the pipe out into the lake itself. And we had to do this uh, via microtunnel. Uh, so you can see here we've got a rather sharp looking fellow there on the right that you may recognize. Uh, but uh, that is the microtunnel boring machine. And what that does is the head turns. Uh, the head is on the, the left side of the photo there. That rotates and basically chews through the material that's in front of it. It's pushed from behind, advances through, chews up that material, uh, and that, that material water is actually brought into the machine through a hose to fluidize that, that material that's been chewed up, and it's returned up to the surface. Uh, this particular microtunnel was about 300 feet long, and it daylights on the bottom of the lake uh, at a depth of about 30 feet uh, from the surface. So what I described, you can see the, uh, on the left side here, you can see that steel pipe that's being advanced out into the lake, so the microtunnel is in front of that, chewing through that material and, and the, the pipe being pushed behind it. And the photo here on the right that you see is the dewatering equipment. So as that fluidized material is brought to the surface, it's pushed through this particular machine through a series of screens where the solids are removed and then the water is returned to the microtunnel machine. So it's a closed loop system. So we're not returning water with lots of stuff in it back to the lake. John, have y'all started tunneling yet? The tunneling operation is actually complete. So it took them about two weeks to do it. When uh, it broke through, what happened? Was it sealed off? I kept, I had trouble thinking about like Jed Clampett, you know. <laughs> No, it's, it, it's not quite like that. It's, it's actually a, a quite an uneventful thing. You really don't, don't see much um, because it's, it's under the water surface. So it, it daylights on the bottom. Uh, they cap that pipe off in the, in, in the wet well. 
Uh, and then what they've got to do is, well, one, they had to prepare the lake bed to receive it, which is what these photos are. They had to launch a barge, get an excavator on it. So what you see here is the, where the Garney team uh, unloaded their barge, assembled it in the lake, and then got the excavator onto it and, and trucked it on down to the intake site. Uh, this is right at, at Highway 27 uh, at, at the Lake Tillery Bridge. Oops. Uh, and that long reach excavator, you can see it there dipping down into the lake and it, it's basically creating a landing pad for, for that microtunnel. Uh, and in the background of the picture, you can see uh, kind of a dumpster back there and that's where the spoils, any material that they remove. And I realize it's hard to see there, uh, but that, that's where all the spoiled material goes uh, and then it's hauled back to land and, and hauled off and disposed of. God, itchy slide finger, I guess. Uh, so the, the next thing we'd, we had to do is, is that microtunnel was advanced out into the lake, that 300 feet, you can see it, it's generally going from that intake, uh, or the, excuse me, the wet well, uh, out to where you see the barge parked there, so it's at a bit of an angle. Uh, so it's tunneled out approximately that 300 feet and it's getting ready to daylight, so as that, uh, when the barge went back, offloaded the excavator, they unloaded a crane uh, so that they could actually pull it out of the water. And in order to do that, we had to do a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we had to send a diver down there because the pipe is attached to the back of that microtunnel. It's welded onto it. So they have to physically cut it loose underwater. So they've got a diving team that goes out there and does that. And once that, that machine has been cut loose, uh, they attach the rigging from the crane and hoist it up to the surface. So you can see, it looks like it's in a lot worse condition than when we started. It was all shiny and new, had some nice stickers, everybody got to sign it. Uh, that lasted for about five minutes. Uh, maybe the first four or five feet that the, the microtunnel machine got and all that was ground off. Uh, but they, they pull this out, they get it all cleaned up, uh, refurbish any parts that need to be uh, replaced, and then it's on to the next job. So what you see here, and uh, uh, Chairman Rape, uh, you can see uh, in the picture on the left, you can see there's, uh, there's a cap on that pipe. Uh, so that is isolated from the lake so they don't, you know, obviously have water pouring into the wet well before we're ready for it. Uh, but now they can work on the remaining uh, form work and concrete work that's got to go on in the bottom of the wet well. And what that is, it, you can see that here in the picture on the right. And what that is, are, they're forming up and pouring the bays where the pumps are going to sit. So these are isolated from each other, so they're not quote unquote fighting each other for, for water. Uh, they're also pouring a baffle block, which you can see right in front of the, the intake pipe. And what that does is it slows that velocity to near zero. Uh, so it's a very still environment uh, and helps avoid any hydraulic conditions which may lead to adverse pump operation. John, when, did, when they, you, the tunnel actually went 300 feet out before it made daylight at the bottom of the lake, but the, the actual pipe itself extends further out into the lake that it's is just correct. elevated up off of the, the lake bed at that point. That is correct. So the microtunnel tunneled on out uh, and the, the intake pipe itself will continue for several hundred feet further uh, and it'll be supported on H piles which will be driven into the lake bed itself. Uh, so that work is forthcoming. Uh, right now the pipe is just where it's at. John, I will tell you, I should have told you earlier, on Facebook, people that have homes over there, there was all kind of explanations about what the crane and the excavator, it was pulling up uh, the B-52 bomber, there was gold in the lake and stuff <laughs> like that. So it was funny. It was, it was nothing that exciting. It was simply a piece of construction equipment. Um, but I'm glad to see imagination at work. All right. Uh, so in addition to that microtunnel work, they're still working on the intake site doing other things. What you see here on the left is uh, some 48 inch diameter steel piping that will feed the surge tank that's on site. Uh, and this is a this is a piece of equipment that's in place in case there's a catastrophic failure of the, uh, of the pumps or anything like that that creates a back pressure wave, gives that system relief so you don't break a lot of things out in the system, valves, uh, burst pipe, that type of thing. So on the, what you'll see 
what you see here is, is the angle uh, moving to the right on the picture. That'll connect to the pump discharge header, and those vertical stubs connect to the surge tank itself. So you can see them lowering it into that excavation uh, via crane, and then uh, you can see it formed up uh, with some rebar for a future concrete pour to encase that pipe. They also continue to work on the raw water transmission main. Uh, what you see on the left here is just a pretty typical uh, cleared right away that's been generally restored. Uh, on the right, you can see them in actually working on installing the pipeline, uh, and they're crossing uh, the nose of a pond here just off New Salem Road. That's in Union County. Uh, again, uh, just a couple of progress photos. Uh, pipeline installation on the left, so this is in Stanley County near Plank Road. Uh, pretty typical cut and cover operation, so they'll clear that right away, uh, go in, do any blasting work that they need to, uh, to make sure that the, the excavator can dig through the rock. Uh, excavate that rock, they lay the pipe, bed it in, cover it with soil, backfill it, uh, and then it's just a rolling progression. Uh, and on the right here, you can see the hydraulic control structure. And one of the important features on the raw water transmission main is that it's actually comprised of two sections. One of them is 42 inches in diameter, and it's a pressurized line. That's 25 miles of it. So it pumps all the way from Lake Tillery, 25 miles, and it hits this hydraulic control structure. The remaining five miles that goes to the plant is, one, it's a larger diameter, it's 54 inch, and it's gravity fed, so it's no longer pressurized. And this is what that, that hydraulic control structure is. It's essentially an air gap in the system. Uh, so that, that work has been complete. Uh, you can see here uh, the formwork on the interior. Uh, and the exterior has all been completed. How many miles is that project, uh, the complete, um, the raw water line? The raw water transmission main is a total of 30 miles. It's 20, roughly 25 miles of 42 inch and five miles of uh, 54 inch pipe. And what's the cost on that? The overall GMP for the project is 146 or $149.7 million, and that includes all the work at the intake site. Uh, so $149.7 million, and that's, that's the pipeline and the intake? Yes, sir. So, okay. That's the phase two construction cost. And 30 is 30 miles long? Yes, the raw water transmission main is 30 miles in length. Okay, thank you. So on the finished water side of things, uh, again, uh, very similar, <laughs> similar approach here. We've got a fixed site, uh, which is the water treatment plant. You can see that here in the uh, upper right. And then in the lower left, again, the finished water transmission main. Again, the color scheme is the same. Uh, green is complete and yellow is underway. So you can see the entire uh, finished water transmission main is underway uh, in one way or another uh, with a section uh, generally east of the bypass. Uh, where that, that installation has been complete. Uh, total contract price, or total contract limit of 119.2 million, and this is comprised of the 117.9 million GMP price and a $1.3 million uh, contingency allowance. Uh, we have had a change order, uh, as, as Manager Watson noted, uh, and this was really for uh, just coordination with that 762 zone or east side transmission main. The lion's share of that cost was associated with electrical gear. So we, rather than having two generators on site, we upsized so we would only have one. It really simplifies that transition if you do have line power failure. Uh, we are dealing with medium voltage uh, electrical gear, so uh, it's a fairly large standalone generator. And it will allow us to run uh, basically half the treatment plant uh, as well as the pumps for the 853 and the 762 zone. So that was the lion's share of that cost. There were some other site improvements uh, or site modifications that needed to be made just to facilitate getting that pipeline off the project for that future, uh, excuse me, off the site for that future project. Uh, and presently, the schedule on the finished water side is running about six weeks behind schedule. So we're kind of neck and neck, uh, about six, six to eight weeks uh, behind the targeted GMP schedule. Uh, but the projects are still in alignment, which is the important piece. John, what's the size of that uh, holding tank that's on the left-hand side there? Uh, that is a six million gallon raw water storage tank. Six, six million gallons. Yes, sir. And the 
finished water transmission main is 36 inch diameter ductile iron pipe. So just to give you an idea of, of how far we've really come on this project, we started construction on the water treatment plant site in earnest in January of 21. And what you see here is just the cleared site. They've got the erosion control set up and a pad cleared for where the job trailers are going to go. You've got New Salem Road in the front end and your uh, <coughs> foreground of the picture, and you're generally looking south uh, on the property. Fast forward to January of 22, and you can see how much has come up out of the ground. So you've got that 6 million gallon raw water storage tank on the left hand side. As you go straight up, you can see the finished water storage tank in the background. Uh, kind of in the central, uh, central portion of that, that photo frame, you can see the, the admin building, the treatment train itself. Uh, there's the finished water pumping facilities and the transfer pumping facilities at the back end there. And then in, kind of in the next third of the picture, you see the maintenance building as well as the chemical building and the start of what is the main electrical building. Uh, up in the far, far right of the uh, photo, you can see the reclamation basins that are part of the uh, water treatment plant as well. So really come a long way in the past year under construction. Uh, taking a closer look, you can see the, the focus now is getting the buildings up and getting those closed in so that the trades can come in and do the interior work that's necessary. So you can see the admin building, uh, the structural steel going up, same thing on the chemical building. And they're also working on wrapping up the, uh, the process train. And what you see on the left here is the filter gallery. Uh, so they're getting the formwork in place to pour, pour that floor slab that goes over that piping uh, so that building over the filters can be erected. Uh, and then the right two photos you see here are of the maintenance building where the structural steel has gone up. And you can actually see that they're starting to put the wall panels up. So it's really starting to take shape out there. Uh, one of the neat things that, that was completed here in January was uh, getting the roof on the finished water uh, storage tank. So unlike the raw water storage tank, this is potable water, so it's got to be enclosed from the environment. So what you see uh, is just an aerial shot on the right uh, where you can see the vents. Uh, those are uh, five of them at various points of the compass around the roof. Concrete's brought in, pumped up onto the roof, and they actually had a crew up on there, uh, up on top of that uh, tank finishing out the concrete. So that, that's all been completed, uh, and there's generally, uh, the, the finished water tank itself is generally complete. There's a little bit of work left to do on the interior, uh, but for all intents and purposes. How many million gallons is the finished water, John? The finished water is a million and a half. And similar to the, uh, the raw water transmission main, they're also working on the finished water transmission main. So on the left here, you can see a pipeline corridor. Again, it's been cleared. A uh, little bit different approach here. Uh, rather than going in and, and blasting, or rather than going in and blasting like they are on the raw water side, they've got a, a machine that comes in uh, and they actually pre-trench. So it'll chew through just about anything. Uh, makes a couple of passes. Uh, it's, it's like a, a ditch witch on steroids. The thing's huge. Uh, but it goes through, clears that, uh, uh, clears that alignment, uh, and then the pipe crew comes back, and they're able to just excavate for that, install the pipe, and backfill. Uh, on the right here, you can see the, uh, an open-cut crossing. This is Sykes Mill Road. Uh, so they've, they've gone across the road. There's a casing pipe in place. Uh, finish water pipe has been pushed through there, and they're just compacting that subgrade, getting ready to put the pavement back. Uh, and you can see I'm putting the pavement back here on the, on the right, so several lifts of asphalt, uh, getting that road back open for service. And as I said, uh, this is one of the locations where we do connect to the existing uh, distribution system. And what you see on the left here is, is a typical fitting for that. So it's a, a fabricated fitting, it's 36, and the outlet in this case is 8 inches. Uh, so once the transmission main has been uh, tested, they'll connect that over to the existing system. In addition to the uh, traditional cut and cover operation, uh, they are also working on what is the last of the trenchless crossings. Uh, this one is the crossing of the Moreau Bypass, uh, and they are set up with the, the machine on the west side, advancing that towards the east. Uh, once this is complete, that'll be the last of the trenchless work that needs to be uh, done for this side of the project. Uh, they, they've been at it for a couple of weeks so far and anticipate to keep working on that for the next couple of weeks. 
So with that, I, I said lots of words there about the projects. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them, or I can go right on through into the into the budget and schedule. Any questions? Okay, proceed. So on the budget, I've I've talked about some numbers uh, at the GMP uh, across both projects. We had, uh, like I said, 274.1 million dollars uh, across both projects with a, a contingency or escalation allowance of 2.7 million. That yielded a total of 276.8, uh, and that's where we are today. So we are within the programmed budget for both sides of the uh, projects. Uh, the overall program budget, is, as I said, is just under $304 million, and that's because we've got roughly $27 million allocated across other items of work. So program management, uh, those are professional services to assist the county with the engineering and construction oversight of the program. Uh, the fiber optic communications, so uh, all these facilities can communicate with each other, as well as all the necessary costs associated with easement and land acquisition, uh, permitting, legal, interlocal uh, agreement costs, uh, et cetera. And what you see there is at the time of GMP, this was at 303.8. As of today, we're looking at roughly 303.9, uh, and that's because we're projecting a slight overrun in land acquisition costs. As you can see from the table there, that represents uh, about a 2% increase from the baseline cost for that line item. Uh, in the context of the overall program, you're talking about three hundredths of a percent. So for all intents and purposes, we are on budget. Uh, it, it, it's also important to note that these activities aren't complete. So it's a moving target. As we get more of the, the acquisitions are closed out, that number gets uh, more refined. So looking at the, the, the phase two costs, so the actual construction piece of it, in terms of cash flow, what you're seeing here is the gray vertical bars are what was expected to be spent on a month over month basis. Uh, and the S curve you're seeing in gray with the square boxes on it is the cumulative expenditure over the, the, the life of the project. Uh, and then the green bars, uh, vertical bars, are what we actually have spent to date, uh, month over month. And the blue line you can see there is the actual cumulative expenditures. And what you're seeing here is a trend where we've spent less than we thought we would uh, in the time that's elapsed so far. And the primary reason for this is because there's about a two-month delay on the project. So if you look at that blue line at the bottom and just shift it over two months, you can see it's pretty much tracking right where it should be. Since we're behind a little bit on the project, what you're going to see going forward is that trend line, or the blue line on the bottom, that the slope of that line is generally going to increase a little bit uh, compared to what was planned. And eventually, as you get out towards the bend in that projected S-curve, they're going to match back up. So that's what we're expecting to see. Keep skipping ahead two slides. I apologize for that. So on the overall schedule, as I've mentioned, we're running about uh, one and a half to two months behind. What you're seeing on this slide is the light and dark blue are the contract completion dates, substantial and final. And then the brown and red are where we are today. So you can see that that shifted roughly two months. Uh, and the, the important takeaway from this slide is that the raw water intake and pump station, that schedule is what's driving the overall program schedule. And the reason is because we have to be able to provide raw water to the water treatment plant in order for it to go through its startup paces. So if that project's delayed, hence the finished water startup is delayed as well. Neither of the pipeline portions of the project are expected to be on the critical path of the project. They're both going to have plenty of float in them, and they're expected to be completed well ahead of the individual facilities. So any questions on the budget or schedule? Uh, you know, I'll remind our commissioners, is it the line going over to Wingate, that's called the 7, what? 762. Zone transmission main, or you can refer to it as the east side transmission main. Right, and that's something a lot of us was interested in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said it's in the design phase now. Yes, sir. When would it be ready to present to us to look at as far as putting it out to bid? 
Uh, well, we could, we wouldn't be able to put it out to bid until such time as completion of the water treatment plant were right. imminent. So uh, that that's at least 16 to 18 months out. So as as far as where exactly it is, design encompasses a lot of things, as you all know. Uh, so when I say something's in design, that could be the beginning, or we could be closing up and, and right at the point where we'd be bidding a project out. So I, I'd be happy to look into that and get back to but you. But going that. over to, to Winget, that was a big part of making sure we had adequate water everywhere, uh, yeah, I it, believe. In, that is correct. In, so. in the interim, the the overall Yadkin project will feed that area through the existing 16-inch line at Old Camden right. uh, until such time as that 24-inch main is in place and then that 16-inch feed that goes to the south, that'll be used as more of an emergency backup uh, to the primary 24 But we've got two tanks in that area too that we need, it would be nice to be able to put water in there as, uh, as soon as we could, wouldn't it? Uh, we do put water in those. Uh, so I'm talking could, about, but is it? I'm just hoping it'll grow. Commissioner Russian. Thank you. I think what he's talking about is like the 16-inch line that goes up Highway 218, feeds the water tank yeah. at uh, Highway 218, almost at the Mecklenburg County line. So, so the 16 until you get ready for, um, I guess, major growth or something, that that larger line wouldn't maybe be needed, or or unless we were providing water for a poultry plant, something of that nature maybe. But uh, there's an existing line that goes up to, eight, to, uh, to 18. I don't know if it's 16 or, or 12. I think it's 16, but it goes all the way over to that tank from Anson County now. Correct? Uh, okay, I, to clarify, I was speaking about the, the interconnect with the existing 16-inch line on Old Camden Road. Right. Now, to, until such time as that 24-inch transmission main is in that goes down to Winget, we will be feeding water through that 16-inch connection at New Salem and Old Camden. It'll go south, back through uh, our current facility at, at Olive Branch, the pump station there, basically coming back through there to feed the 762 zone. Right. So we'll be supplying that area with Yadkin water from day one. Uh, but it'll take some time to build the 24-inch line and get that in service. I guess what I'm trying to say is we've been, some of us have kind of been like a bullfrog. We wouldn't move. But on that line, that was one that we added, moved it up on the long-range plan. So mm -hmm. the day, the time, the day comes that we can do that. If I'm here, I'll be in favor of it. So understood john just to, to just to clarify at, at old camden we're, uh, we will be pushing water south toward wing at marshville filling those tanks and filling the, and, and servicing the 762 through that pipe currently that water runs from south to north i Generally, it, I, I, generally I, speaking, yes. We, yeah. we pull water from Anson as, as right. typical operations. Mm -hmm. We pull water from Anson, and then it's pumped from the booster station up to the Highway 218 yeah. tank. With the Yadkin project online, that operation is, is essentially reversed. reversed. Right. So we're, we're pulling water from the north, and it, it flows by gravity back into the system. But uh, from Camden Road up to 218 to the water tank there, we are continue to send water north to the 218 tank at the same time. Yes. So basically water, instead of water all flowing in one direction, when it gets to Camden Road, it's going to diverge and water's going south to serve 762 and water's going north up to 218. That is correct. It's a T intersection. I apologize for the confusion. You know, the more we're around you engineers, we get to thinking we almost engineers, so we try to help you solve the problem. I'm, I'm taking up time, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's quite all right. I'm glad I could provide a little bit of clarity on that. Um, so fun fact, uh, and this is, this is my close out here. So uh, we approved the GMPs back in July of 2020 and gave notice to proceed to the teams in August, uh, late August, early September. So at that time, uh, you know, there was a certain cost associated with the overall program. And one of the things that we, we did as an exercise uh, was we went back and we looked at what the pipeline costs were as part of that GMP. And we, we just looked at materials. 
Um, and what we found was at the time of GMP, across both projects, you were looking at a cost of about $53.3 million, and that was for the materials. If you were to do that today, that those same materials would cost just over $19 million more. So in the year and a half that we've been underway, you've seen a 36% jump. That's what this represents. Just in the cost of the basic materials, the cost to produce it, transport it, and get it to a point where it can be installed. So the takeaway from all that is that early decisions save us money. Uh, so we, we could not have timed the Yadkin project much better than we did uh, in light of the current economic conditions. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, other than that, that's all I've got for you tonight. Any, Commissioner Simpson. Thanks, John, for that presentation. Uh, if you will, take just a minute. I know uh, uh, myself and Commissioner Helms serve on sort of the liaison group, uh, and we meet sort of on a quarterly basis with the folks from uh, Norwood and talk about the project along with uh, the uh, consultants uh, that we work with. Uh, mention just briefly the communication effort and the, the, the attempt. This is a big project. People like Dennis said they were looking for Loch Ness Monster over there or something. <laughs> uh, a lot of talk and you see things happening. Uh, and we've made every effort to inform the public, uh, to provide opportunities for them to find information on the project. Uh, so just mention briefly a little bit about that. Well, sure. The, the, the program as a whole, we've had a, a, I would say, a robust communications effort from the get-go. So th this goes back, I mean, hop in your way back machine. You can go back to uh, 2013 when the interlocal agreement was, was executed with the town of Norwood, uh, and the ball really started rolling on this project. Uh, but we, we have made every effort uh, as the project has moved through its very various phases to communicate with the public. So we had, uh, at the initial onset, we had public meetings on the project, just inviting everybody who was in the conceptual corridor to come and talk to us about uh, concerns that they may have about where things were going to be and what we needed to know, tried to solicit that input from the community. Uh, We've had continual engagement with the town of Norwood, so that's been on a quarterly basis, uh, generally speaking, subject to availability, of course, but uh, there, there's communication between the political leadership on the project, day-to-day uh, -day outreach. Uh, both of the, the contracting teams have business cards, and they hand those out to people, uh, and that directs folks to the project website, which is actively maintained and updated based on uh, where we are in the, the overall scheme of the project. Uh, it also gives them a hotline that they can call. So if there's an issue, it gives them a ready phone number that is logged, categorized, and responded to by the appropriate personnel. Uh, you know, beyond that, we, we do, news, uh, we do uh, excuse me, newsletters, uh, social media posts, um, generally anything that we can brainstorm in order to better communicate the value of this project to the community. Thank you, John. Commissioner Russia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John, I, I seem to remember a cost of around $30 million on the finished water line, just the line. And I thought it was a similar cost to that line that was coming in from Norwood. And you said $147 million, but um, you yeah, know, that's the, the plant there, that's the intake center. You know, is, is that cost closer to 30 or $40 million for the actual water line going through the ground? So generally speaking, uh, the, the raw water infrastructure project, so it's comprised of the intake, pump station, and then the raw water transmission main. The overall cost for that transmission main is roughly 92 to 93 million dollars. It's the lion's share of the cost of the project. The, the intake itself is, is a much smaller share of that. Okay. The, the, the total cost of that project, and I would have to go back and, and get you solid numbers on that, but mm -hmm. if memory serves, that's kind of the split. And, and, I'm, and I'm interested in, in that cost per mile because of an earlier presentation we had on running water lines down the roads because that those pictures were impressive of how much dirt's being moved how much land had to be acquired things like that 
and then I'm kind of comparing it to what it costs us per mile to run a water line to serve a customer and see what the comparison there is. Mr. Manager, if you could possibly get that information for me, I'd appreciate that because, you know, it seems like the cost comparison of doing a mile of uh, drinkable water versus the cost of this is, is uh, kind of, I don't know, it looks, it looks like it's kind of close to me, but, um, you know, I'm looking at $5 million per mile if you used, um, if you had all the facilities to it versus uh, less, you know, about $3 million per mile um, for running this water across there. And then maybe what's our cost to run it down the road to serve customers? So just to make sure that I'm clear with what you're you're asking, you're you're asking for a cost comparison uh, for the amount a cost per mile mm -hmm. to run the raw water line mm -hmm. uh, compared to the cost per mile to, to run clean drinking water to run clean drinking water in a distribution right like we've talked about with um, with our uh, water lines for the that we're talking about using the cares act funding for yeah 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 you know, we we saw that huge number of 374 million dollars for how many miles you know how many first that, that's kind of what i'm trying to get at is cost per mile because it looks like right. that cost i, I per remember mile. your concern over the cost per mile for right the, yeah right thank you thank you thank you john Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, if I could uh, ask the board to uh, remove item number twenty-two oh seven zero, we are not prepared to make that presentation this evening, and um, mm -hmm. we will be prepared at the first meeting in March to do that, but uh, circumstances have risen and uh, we're not prepared to uh, deliver that presentation this evening. Mr. K, do we need to vote or just remove it? You just skip over it. Okay. All right, uh, 22069, board discussion of various procedures used to appoint advisory or regulatory board members. Mr. Manager. Commissioners, thank you. I am, uh, as the manager said here this evening, to respond to your request for more information on how you might be able to enhance your uh, board and committee appointment procedures for certain committees. I effectively have four things to say to you, and then I will uh, sit down and you all can deliberate either here or amongst yourselves uh, after the meeting as you see fit. Uh, I'm going to talk with you about what your current boards uh, and committees are. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about the uh, smaller set of committees that you might consider an enhanced procedure for. Uh, then I'm going to talk about your current procedures and then some things that you might do to uh, beef that up should you so choose. So the first thing is you'll see the current list of boards and committees there. It's quite a large list. Uh, you can see that uh, at various times during the year you make appointments to those and members serve in their various functions. I would say that this entire list as well as some more detail as to what the boards do and their, how their membership is composed is available on our website as well for anyone who wants to take a look. Amongst those boards there are just a handful that uh, 
rise to the level of boards that have a little bit more uh, uh, influence because of the way your advisory or approval structures function. There is no magic to this list of boards. You can select anything to go on or off of here. Some of the things that we used uh, were the level of their advisory approach, uh, sometimes the levels of expertise that are mandated by statute, sometimes whether these boards are uh, required by statute or whether there are things that, that we have created here in Union County. And uh, one of the, the boards, for example, that is not on there is your Economic Development Commission uh, because of the recent change that has taken place and the methods of appointment that you've already gone through for that. Generally, it's members of this board that go on to that group, but that's certainly something you could uh, change in the future so, should you want to do that. Uh, your current procedure is in your rule of procedure number 32. And I have summarized it here. It's a little bit more wordy than that in uh, your rules, but uh, basically you send out notice to the community by publishing notice uh, in a variety of different ways on a bulletin board in a newspaper. Uh, you can run it in a local cab cable TV uh, station or other reasonable notification designed to notify the public. Uh, you can include any or all of those. Uh, they just need to be received by the clerk not later than 5 p.m. on the Tuesday before the meeting at which you're going to start making appointments. And then your process right now does not speak to assessing uh, particular qualifications or digging in more deeply to some things. You have freedom to do that right now, should you so choose or not. Uh, basically, you just open the floor to nominations and put forward some names and debate them. And then you call nominees and take a vote. And when you get a majority of votes, sometimes it's much more simple than that. Uh, it doesn't always follow this much complicated uh, procedure in the way that you do that approval. Uh, but should the need arise, that is the process. Here are a list of things that you might consider uh, that we have taken from other boards uh, across the state that they use, uh, some things that we have suggested or brainstormed simply uh, to think about. Uh, the, and the first principle to keep in mind is that the Board of County Commissioners always makes the appointment. There's no other group that makes the appointment. This full board makes the appointment. Uh, the second is that in the process of creating the application, you might consider whether to add some additional targeted questions. Uh, if there's specific levels of expertise or involvement or a track record that you would like to see for certain boards and committees, you can uh, request information on that in the application and we would certainly be glad to provide you with some options in that area if you want to explore that. But then secondly, in the applicant vetting process, the interview process, if you will, you could create an ad hoc board of commissioners small group to review it. Uh, obviously, you can't go any larger than groups of two, so that becomes a little bit cumbersome. But that is uh, in order to comply with the state's open meetings laws and make sure we are doing everything within the public eye that requires it. Uh, you could consider more than one ad hoc group. You could consider uh, a, a per committee group uh, or you could have it for all designated committees. In other words, you could say this is the group for committee A that we're going to employ and this is the group for committee B and committee C and so forth. Or you could say here's a group that we're going to use for all of these board or committee appointments. Uh, you could also uh, ask for existing committee members. Uh, that is the group of uh, the committee spot that you're trying to fill. There are going to be existing committee members on there. You could ask for their advice and input uh, or some subset of that committee. They could interview applicants and present recommendations to the board for your consideration. Uh, you could also uh, identify some designated stakeholders that you want to be a part of that review. And they could be on the board, off the board, on the committee, off the committee. Uh, and then lastly, you could adopt multiple layers of review with two or more of those elements above for use in vetting candidates. So for example, you could use 
uh, a part of a committee of existing members to review applications, interview them, and then you could add an ad hoc group of yourselves to interview them, groups of two or more, and then come together with a recommendation. It's really up to you, but they ultimately fall into one of those two buckets, either the candidate ask, presenting more information to you, and then secondly, you drilling down as deeply as you want to drill, uh, either yourselves or with some other group of persons participating in that process. That said, uh, it is uh, <coughs> your uh, time for discussion and direction uh, to staff, whatever you think you can give that in this meeting, or you can think about it and come back to us at a later time. Commissioner Hale. Yes, I, uh, I asked for this because I had the privilege of participating in a review for the DHS board, and it was an extremely effective process. We had a number of applicants, and unfortunately, a lot of times on our board, we don't have a number of applicants. But I think through the process that uh, it was evident we got the most qualified individuals to sit on that board. Uh, so I see value in that, especially in Board of Adjustments, Planning Board, and, and your other suggestions are appropriate as well. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like for the board to pursue that. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's it j just so happened on the, uh, at, I was on the DHS board at that time, so I was a commissioner representative there. And the other two individuals were on the board. And uh, we went through a process and each rate ranked the applicants and, and uh, it matched perfectly, every one of us. And so, uh, I think it's a good process because uh, like the DHS board, uh, Michelle will tell you how critical that board is. And we saw it just now in the past during this pandemic. And some of our other boards are equally uh, critical to the operation of the county. Uh, yeah, Go ahead, Commissioner Rusher. Thank you. Um, with the Health and Human Services Board kind of being a different, I mean, the qualifications that are required there, some are like JCPC Board if you have to have qualifications to be on certain, uh, um, you know, if, if there's certain requirements that they would have to meet. There's, there are boards where there are requirements, and that's listed. We, we, on the Parks and Recreation Board, we used to have a place for, it had to be a handicapped individual uh, that used park services or that to, for access to park services. But as far as the us appointing them you know by a committee of two i really see where that could be a problem for example like tonight you know we had some rezonings some are some are supported by the planning board some are not but we get the final say in that and we can discuss it just like uh, you know commissioner williams had his difference with with uh, the other four of us tonight and i could have been different on something but we've, we don't really have a lot of problems with the way that we appoint boards now we're you know the, the way we appoint boards now in the county for example let's say that you had developers that were or commissioners more development friendly and they only recommended developers be on the planning board i know that the public would have a problem with that of saying wait a minute you know why is this board so heavy with developers well they're very qualified to make you know recommendations for zoning and planning however you know the people have their say in it too so so i don't know that i don't I don't know that I want to change too much the direction we're going in or that we've been doing. If we had more problems with it, you know, maybe I would be willing to look at that. But, uh, you know, I just don't see all the, the – I like having a say, and, and usually we all agree. Uh, sometimes we might not. You know, there might be somebody, again, that two commissioners really like that the other three find so distasteful that – But it's not, you know, the, the – group made a recommendation to this board mm -hmm. so whatever process it go through it would come as a recommendation to this board now, to, to that's what be, i that's what i understood commissioner yeah. Helms after he told me the process so it's uh, not going to go on the consent agenda like no no no, no but it's, and it would and and actually one thing i picked up at the school board if you have a discipline issue with children they set up groups of board members and so we could have groups of two and uh the chairman whoever it was at the time if it was ag you know we could assign jerry and uh stoney or jerry and me or me you know if it's legal 
we would assign David. Uh, not that that's, he's limited to that. Uh, uh, David and Richard. And they would be the ones that would actually meet with the people and then they could come back and communicate. Well, generally, the way I do it, I mean, the way I, the, the advice I take in it is like if Jerry comes in and, and nominates um, two people for the Ag Advisory Board, I tend to follow his recommendation because he has to serve with them and he, ha and he knows the board. Or like if uh, somebody, like when you come in with Health and Human Services, you know, I tend to listen to the person that's serving on that board. Uh, you know, I tend to not, not even make nominations until that person speaks up. And I tend to nominate JCPC members or, or um, you know, people that I'm on the boards of. So, so again, I, not, not a big problem with this except for, um, you know, I just, I just don't want it to be two commissioners picking the person. Um, out of respect, where you normally support each other's recommendations, and and uh, but I don't. I've seen it the other way. Well, you know, I tell you the way way we had this one. I happened to be a commissioner on it. We had two other members that were filed under fell under different categories, and I would I would say the same thing. If we we're going to do the ag advisory, I mean, we need to have some ag representatives on there too that they can help us ask the right questions to make sure. Uh, the motivation to be on that board is is, is right. Uh, I, we, and sometimes the answers you get, it uncovers that maybe that individual is not the person to be on that board. Uh, I mean, I don't have any problem with if one commissioner was in each committee and then we have some more, and that you know that alleviates two two commissioners. What what if we what if we did it that way? What if um, maybe the commissioner on the board is responsible for interviewing the, the people and, and maybe rec making that recommendation. Uh, that way, again, that, that we, uh, we're just making a recommendation. We're not telling them that's who's going to be on the board, but um, that might prevent any kind of committee from having to even be formed, correct? We'd that's correct, Commissioner Rushing. Uh, by having one board member effectively do the interviewing, it ensures that it's merely a recommendation that they're made, making. At the end of the day, this board as a whole has to make all of these appointments. You, I don't think you could deputize a smaller group of yourselves to make that appointment. At best, they can make that recommendation. And, and that prevents that person from having a call. Like, like if you have two people, and the trouble we're having is not having enough people apply exactly. new. It's not really necessarily if you have too many people apply. You had an odd situation, but, but like those people could call and talk to the commissioner that's representative on that board. The, that commissioner could do pluses and minuses like you're, you're saying and, and then show the rest of the board that, uh, you know, that recommendation and then the board could take it or leave it. But uh, that would be less formal and probably less, less hurt feelings maybe. And, and that commissioner has to serve on that board. I have to explain that to the people as well. Well, the problem is, is, is right now we do a handwritten and sometimes they elaborate on their skills and their interest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't. Right. And having the interview process I think is what's beneficial to sit down and have a conversation uh, let's can I offer a suggestion let's put this decision off for two weeks okay and and uh, I think what Stoney's wanting and what Richard's wanting I think is really the same thing not too different just less formal and less uh, you know like if you and David were on a well first of all if you and David were picking all of them then you, how would I know? How would you know who I like on Parks and Rec, or how how would you know who Jerry likes on the Ag Committee, and 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 so almost a thing where you got to get two commissioners, different commissioners, to kind of rotate around, and and it might just be easier for that one just to interview those people. Well, I I, I can tell you if if I was one of the people doing the interview and it was the Ag commu community, I'd want some experienced Ag. Uh, Involvement, so I would, you know, I would say I'd, I'd want the input for some some of the others too. Uh, we came up with, some, we met before and had had some basic questions, and the various members asked asked the questions, and asked the same question of all the people that apply. I mean, it was the same script uh, to make sure that you know one didn't get preferential treatment, and you know, ask how your family's doing, and that's all we're asking. But uh, I think the process, the process brought out some very interesting information, and I feel comfortable that we, we chose the right candidates that was made a recommendation. I, 
I'm just saying I could see that benefit on some of these others, like the planning board. You know, planning board, your comment is very correct. You know, we put, we put uh, a major developer on there and uh, he's, yeah, do the high density, do the high density, do the high density, and it may not be good for the county. But there's, but there's no problem with that one person having that opinion as long no. as the board's evened out. You know, you need, you need people with various opinions, just like our board. We have people with various opinions. Sometimes we all agree, and sometimes we two of us will disagree, and three of us will agree. What if we put all realtors on the planning board? Guess what <laughs> that, we'd have, that, right? that, That's happened in the past. So, uh, or, you well, know, it's been heavily loaded in the past with builders and developers, and the complaints started from the community. So, you know, even and think think about this in the in the two weeks we're going to take, because I, I agree maybe take a couple of weeks and look at it. I'm fine with that. Think about maybe the... Um, maybe the staff some that we have actually like a, an assistant manager or somebody yeah. interview those people no problem. and and get the but it's the interview process yeah. that i think sit down and talk to people about what their their intent on being on the board is what they want to accomplish and what they want for the county right. okay we'll uh commissioners if i may just as a point of clarity for staff uh would it be your preference that we take and summarize what you've said and try to bring it back in front of you in some sort of crystallized way for next week or would you like to just ruminate on it amongst yourselves and, and talk about it I don't think you could write that book in two weeks <laughs> so. <laughs> but you can try I, I think it, it's, it's good for us to communicate among ourselves and share opinions and yeah and we, we I, we've been known to change each other's mind so right that's exactly right I think I think that's what it'll do, uh, this pre-interview by two commissioners. And I have no trouble with letting Richard and Stoney be the, the driving force of deciding who does what. You know, just trying to get people to co that want to serve on these committees to come talk to y'all. And uh, Well, and again, I, like, like I said, with the, on the Ag Committee or... We're on well on the on the water you know if we had to put some people um on a, any richard kind of said he would acquiesce to jerry on the yeah. ag selection I, I wouldn't mind doing my own committees like having an you know like the committees i have to serve on parks and rec or or um, you know jcpc or whatever doing some kind of interview if we had a template of what we can and can't ask because i don't want to get on there and ask how many kids they got if i can't ask that question or anything, anything that I don't, you know, Jason, you'll probably need to give us some ideas or Mark, you know, what can we ask people? What are we, because I'm sure there's some questions we should not ask people uh, legally and um, maybe have that format for all of us to use and contact those. And folks. we went through that exercise to make sure we weren't yeah. asking inappropriate <laughs> And as they said about Forrest, Commissioner Simpson's getting ready to say something, so. <laughs> no, I was just going to make a point about the Ag Committee. There's, uh, and this could be the same with other committees. Uh, there's specifics in their uh, charter statute or wh whatever that mm -hmm. uh, specifies that you have to be represented by um, uh, townships and that kind of thing. So the Ag Committee does vet applications prior to them coming before this board. So okay. there is input from the committee itself well, on that particular one. Commissioner anyway. leadership for a long time, too. <laughs> You were pecking at that on and off speaker thing. come on. <laughs> okay. Well, that was a good discussion, and we'll put it on next agenda. Okay. Manager comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Just a couple of, rem of reminders prior to the board's regular meeting on March the 7th, uh, a joint meeting with South Piedmont Community College uh, has been scheduled for 4 p.m. for the purpose of receiving their capital construction needs um, and uh, associated funding requests uh, related to those needs for the coming year. Say that uh, date again, please, sir. Say that date again. March the 7th. March 7th. And that's at 4 p.m. prior to your regular meeting thank you march the 14th uh reminder at 3 p.m we have our next budget workshop uh and of interest uh, 
several months ago, uh, board members brought to my attention that um, perhaps the county had responsibility uh, for the old county home cemetery and staff has looked into that and um, as it turns out uh, the county still owns that property um, and very little has been done to keep it up or maintain it since the early 1970s um, since bringing that to staff's attention I just want the board to know that uh, we have completed a land survey of the property boundaries um, we have communicated with the neighbors uh, we have marked uh, had those uh, property lines marked and we are in the process of clearing away the undergrowth that was pretty heavy and pretty thick on that property uh, some 170 uh, individuals uh, are buried there um, they were all uh, wards of Union County at one point or another between early 1900s and the late 1940s and uh, we'll continue with that project and I'll be bringing you a more formal update in the near future thank you mr. chairman commissioner Sampson uh, thank you mr. chairman uh, just a couple of things I'd like to uh, to uh, say a special thanks to pastor Marty Benfield he's with uh, Valley Church of Indian Trail uh, did a great job and uh, so if you're uh, in that area or looking for a church, uh, certainly look him up. Uh, the other thing I'd mention is uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, the manager and administrative staff for uh, the little tour we had put together today. We got the opportunity to uh, take a first look at the uh, 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 sheriff's facilities and uh, expansion out there at the jail, along with the uh, emergency services uh, uh, here uh, over on uh, near the uh, Health and Human Services building. Uh, both of those facilities are futuristic. They're cutting edge. They're gonna make Union County proud. And it certainly goes to show that uh, uh, when we put those uh, uh, five tenants that we stand behind as a county, uh, public safety number one, it certainly is evident through what we saw today. So I commend you on that and I look forward to those being completed. Commissioner Russian. No comment. Commissioner Helms. Uh, I'd just like to say congratulations to Catherine Brown. She will be missed. And I think uh, I know that she helped this board more than a lot of people realize when, as we prepare for public uh, meetings and interviews and things like that. She did a fantastic job. Uh, I feel confident with Liz still around. We'll be in good hands, but uh, we wish her well. That's all. Commissioner Williams no comments mr. chairman okay uh, before I I've got I need to announce that we're advertising a vacancy for an unexpired term on the planning board because of a resignation uh, and I want and it's already I believe been posted on our board out back well it will be very shortly and uh, it's for an unexpired term uh, that ends 4-19-2023. Uh, the guy, uh, very, uh, Russell Wing, retired for some health reasons and a uh, very good friend of mine and a lot of you know him too and friends with him. Jerry, don't shoot me, but uh, on that upcoming, Jerry says he's the funniest person in the world when you get him one-on-one. -on -one. He, uh, I asked him, I said, I'll let you sit at the front of the table with the South Piedmont because you're on that trustee, you're a trustee and you're a commissioner. He said, how about I come in with my f face painted like Braveheart, <laughs> blue, you know, blue on one side and black on the other. And then he went on to say they had been looking at the Simpson family crest and, uh, he said they traced it back to William Wallace from that movie Braveheart. And I said, man, Braveheart on one side and Belk stores on the other. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I think we've traced ours back to uh, Longshanks. <laughs> <laughs>
But he says some of the funniest stuff. That's why when I saw over he was going. Any rebuttal before we? I think you've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. We're going to not adjourn. We're going to go back into closed session. Uh, so we'll go back in there, and I'll put us back in session.